Professor Soraya Tremaine from Oxford University, who will be speaking on third-party gamete donation in Iran, the shift from all in the family to going it alone. Right. Well, first, I, I would like to thank um, Ayman Shabana and his team for kind invitation. It's such an opportunity to be here and share my findings with, with you all and meet uh, new people with new research. Um, that's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, let me make my position clear. I am not um, a specialist of Islam. Um, I'm a social anthropologist, and what I say about Islam, the extent of my work on Islam is the involvement of the Islamist jurists in legitimizing or not legitimizing the assisted reproductive technologies in Iran. So that, that is my approach. And also, um, following from everything that we heard this morning about um, the Sunni Islam, and I'm <laughs> offering a different perspective, which is the 12 um, uh, Shia Iranians who have got a different understanding of assisted reproductive technologies and the way they practice it from the rest of the Muslim world. Um, so the introduction of assisted reproductive technology to Iran and their legitimization has been extensively addressed by various uh, scholars from different perspectives. And I, I'm not going to go into details of how that was done, although I will give you a brief explanation of this. Um, really what uh, the purpose of this paper is, now that is about 20 years or longer that these reproductive technologies have been practiced in Iran, I am looking at the changes which are happening uh, now uh, and how this is affecting the family and the understanding of what lineage is and um, how the users of these um, assisted reproductive technologies are making use of them to, to fit their own agenda and their own understanding of what family means. Um, so um, to date, Iran, which is a Muslim country with over 90% 12 Shia followers, remains the only Muslim country in the world that has allowed the use of assisted reproductive technologies in all their forms and continues to do so as new technologies are introduced into the country. As um, Professor Inhorn explained this morning and has written extensively, the Sunni only allow the IVF between wife and husband and um, uh, no third party donation is taking place among the Muslim Sunni. Whereas the Shia in Iran have allowed uh, the use of uh, these technologies in all their forms, sperm donation, egg donation, surrogacy, embryo donation, and every time the te these technologies are introduced, um, um, some way has been found, mainly with assistance from the Islamist jurists to legitimize them. Uh, so as ARTs and their practice continue to develop and offer new choices to their users, their regulation and practices continue to evolve accordingly. In this sense, it could be argued that ARTs remain in, the state of in a state of flux wherever they are practiced, but that it is the degree and extent of this fluidity which varies from country to country. As we have seen, they are changing all the time everywhere. These variations are determined by a number of factors, including their regulatory bodies and their power of enforcement, as well as the agency of the recipients of ARTs in the way they make sense of these technologies to fit their own understanding of reproduction. Iran is no exception to this fluctuation, as has remained in a state of flux since the introduction of ARTs to the country. Um, as Marcia this morning showed, the, the book we have edited together called Islam and Assisted Reproductive Technologies fully addresses these problems and how these have been dealt with. However, what makes Iran different from most other countries is that no single official body was created initially, nor does it exist today in the country, 
as responsible for the legitimization and regulation of reproductive technologies. Usually there is a body dealing and allowing or not allowing the use of these technologies, whereas in Iran, we haven't had such a body. The practice of ART has been made possible through close cooperation between the medical practitioners, the leading Islamic jurists, experts in civil law, in social sciences, in ethics, and in other relevant disciplines, culminating in opinions expressed by Islamic jurists in the form of religious edicts. So in what follows, I propose to explore the gradual shift in the practice of ARTs and its consequences for lineage and biological relatedness, the protection of which was the sole condition upon which ARTs were legitimized in the first place. I shall focus on how conceiving through third party gamete donation in the secrecy of the clinics, it has become possible for the infertile individuals to use donor gametes and pretend to be the biological parents of the resulting child. In the process, they outwardly, what we call the Zahir, prove to have continued the lineage. Inwardly, in Baten, such a compromise and the disruption of bloodline effectively suggest the fundamental shakeup of the deeply rooted beliefs in the paramount importance of lineage. So the question arises as to whether the sanctity of lineage will eventually become a myth enacted by barren individuals, and whether and how this rift or duality between the Zahir and Baten will be, will be reconciled or could be reconciled. So this is really the question. So to give you a little background on the history, uh, uh, while the process of the introduction and legitimization and practice of ARTs are well documented. Information and evidence of the state's interest, Iranian state's interest in infertility and its treat treatment remains scant. In fact, during the late 1980s when the first um, IVF um, technologies arrived in Iran, the Iranian state was more concerned about reducing the population and infertility was not high on its agenda. Uh, and it was not until the 2011 census in Iran which showed that the population had dropped drastically and the total fertility rate had become 1.2 below the replacement level that the state was alarmed. In fact, um, Ahmadinejad, who was the prime minister at the time and the supreme religious leader Ayatollah Khamenei, um, went public and started encouraging people to have more children. And in fact, Ayatollah Khamenei uh, publicly said that uh, he felt guilty and responsible as well for having encouraged people to have fewer children. So the state's uh, policy was reversed and became a pronatalist one to increase the population. And within this agenda, uh, the question of infertility shifted from the private sector, because so far it had been in the hands of the private sector, to becoming a matter for public health. And the state uh, took over the treatment of infertility, and they moved towards uh, making measures, in, putting measures in place to um, regulate it. And, and, and look at various aspects of how they can Im improve it. And this was because a survey which was carried out in 2011, at the same time as the census about population was published, that showed, it was a survey of 17,000 households, which showed that 20% of married couples within this survey were infertile. I mean, the broader definition of infertility. And another survey estimated that, uh, the number of infertile, couple to, infertile people to be three million in the country. So it was a considerable number. And the state, which now had a pronatalist policy, saw the potential in addressing the question of infertility as part of its policy of uh, increasing population growth. Previously to the state's interest, um, uh, fertility, Treatment, infertility treatment had been considered as cosmetic surgery because it all happened outside the body and even the insurance didn't cover the costs of it. It was entirely in the hands of the private sector. But with the shift toward, towards considering it as a, 
a public health matter, it became a disability rather than being a cosmetic matter. So with the introduction of in vitro fertilization, IVF to Iran, the physicians who first introduced them to the country were mindful of the Islamic beliefs which consider procre procreation to be within the divine power and not in the gift of the humans to control. In the absence of a regulatory body, the pioneers, medical pioneers, sought the opinion of the Islamic jurists on the permissibility of using IVF to treat infertility. The majority of these juries approved of the practice of IVF on the condition that it remained limited to married heterosexual couples. At the same time, the medical pioneers also realized that the application of ARTs and their outcome were not limited to the realm of biomedicine or religion alone and had broader social, cultural, legal, and psychological implications. Therefore, they also reached out to ethicists, legislators, social scientists, and other relevant experts to explore the congruence of ARTs within the norms and values attached to procreation and their possible consequences for family, kinship, and society in general. While the practice of IVF between a married couple did not initially lead to a strong controversies among the experts, it was the introduction of third-party gamete donation, which required a more profound exploration of the permissibility of these state-of-the-art technologies and their implications for the deeply rooted beliefs surrounding reproduction. The use of third-party gamete to proceed seemed discordant with the prohibition by Islamic law of conception outside marriage, and with the position that the only acceptable form of reproduction is through heterosexual marital union, resulting in one's own biological children. Um, Professor Inhorn has written extensively about that in the, about the Arab world, and have, I have also written about that on Iran. The experts, and more specifically, the Islamic jurists needed to find valid arguments to justify the legitimacy of third-party donation, which could be a potential threat for the purity of lineage, and yet would allow the continuity of the family line. However, although some solutions were eventually found to legitimately allow third-party donation, and I'm not going into that because it's too lengthy, uh, the deliberations of the experts did not lead to a unanimous verdict. And to date, the opinions of the Shia Islamic jurists, which were crucial in allowing the practice of ARTs, it remains divided. The jurists who are the sources of emulation, or marja'i taqlid, for the Shia followers, justified their verdicts by resorting to the interpretation of the Islamic sources, ijtihad, and arriving at their own independent reasoning, issuing religious edicts, fatwas, on the permissibility of IVF technologies. Um, as those of you who are familiar with the Shia practices, you know that there are several sources of imitation marjai taqlid among the Shia, and the opinion of these um, sources of emulation is equally valid. In other words, if some uh, one of the ayatollahs doesn't agree with the other one, it doesn't mean uh, they are equally valid, and each one of these sources of emulation have got their own followers. As uh, Robert Tappan, who is a specialist in, um, a scholar in Islamic ethics, theology, and law, explains, I'm quoting, there is also a religious duty upon each Shia believers to follow the rulings of one high-ranking source of emulation. This leads to a plurality of equally authoritative religious rulings, which might differ greatly from one another and may vary from the state law as well, end of quote. So this, this diversity of the jurist's opinions, especially on the question of third party donation, persists to date and has opened a gap which allows room for maneuvering by all the parties involved to make choices on the most suitable use of ARTs to befit them. So in general, the edicts of the sources of emulation fell into three groups. Those which forbid the use of IVF in any form, third party donation, which is viewed as the intrusion into the marriage is forbidden or haram. Uh, those which are um, favorable towards the use of some ARTs based on conditional permission and depending on the circumstances and the edicts of those groups which allow the use of all th th third-party donation in all its form. 
Um, I am not going to apologize for repeating again and again the importance of lineage in all that upon which it was based, that it's, you are allowed to, um, to have IVF, you are allowed to have third-party donation, provided that you keep the lineage. Now, the lineage itself is very much linked to... So that was clarified by the, those ayatollahs who were in favor of, of a third-party gamut donation. But at the same time, in Islam, the question of lineage is very closely linked also to inheritance. You cannot inherit from somebody if you are not blood relative of that person. And this was never really clarified by any of these ayatollahs and has remained confusing to date. I mean, an example of that is, for example, that uh, children who are adopted, because Iran allows adoption, um, do not necessarily inherit from their adopted parents. And uh, even wives uh, do not in, only inherit it in Iran. Uh, about one-eighth of the movable belonging of their husbands. This law has been revised now recently, but because the wife wasn't also a blood relative. So, you know, that, that was it. And uh, one of the conditions upon which um, some of the ayatollahs allowed their party donation, they said, the child will belong to the donor of the gamut, to his biological parent, uh, but can take its name from the social parent. At the same time, more and more clinics have started moving towards making the donors anonymous, the donors who were not relatives who were given gamut. So therefore, it was a confusion if the child doesn't know who his parents are, how he's going to inherit from them. But also in the early days, the, uh, when a gamut donation was allowed, there was no a fatwa saying that relatives could not give donate gamut to each other. And the first port of call for the infertile people was to call on their relatives. Sibling donation was great, and it still exists very much in Iran. And uh, therefore, it was all win-win, because when you receive a gamut from your relative, you keep it all in the family, and your bloodline is not interrupted. But over the 20 years, so many problems have come up among the people who are do donors of gametes, who are family, that the uh, clinics started moving more and more towards making the donation anonymous and taking it in under their own control. Uh, to stop these problems. For example, i just give you one example. Uh, some years ago, two sisters, one sister donated an egg to her sister, and the child was seven years old when the donor's sister's, her own child died in a car accident. And the sister came and claimed the child from her sister, saying, I want the child back. And the court allowed her because of the fat was the way fat was were given that the donor of the gamut is the owner, the biological parent is the owner of the child. So the child went back to the original donor. And this is one of the many, many problems that have been encountered. But now, um, now that um, the state is taking over to uh, the, uh, the infertility um, uh, treatment, uh, they are debating at the moment currently, and a bill had been sent to the parliament to make donation anonymous. And it hasn't yet been approved, but it's moving in that way as if it's going to be approved, in which case, if it becomes anonymous, then the sibling donation is not going to be practiced. And that means, and it's already happening, that the infertile couple go to the clinic and um, resort to gametes donation by a third party, but claim that the child is their own. They never uh, disclose their own, the fact that they have received gametes from a third party. And um, I'm just saying this last one, and I'll, I'll stop then. Um, so in theory, anonymous donation will mean that no donation can take place by relatives and any conception through anonymous donation will mean a disruption in the bloodline on a large scale because the government is opening many, many infertility clinics and helping financially the infer poor infertile couples. 
On the upside, what also emerges is that anonymous donation, if successful, enables the infertile couples to claim biological parenthood. It is clear that in the choice between believing in the continuing of the lineage or proving one's reproductive ability and dispelling the stigma of infertility, anonymity will be an easy and tempting one to choose. Here we are faced with the paradox that ARTs, which are supposed to weaken the stigma of infertility and remove it in the long run, are further reinforcing it by enabling the infertile individuals to deny their infertility. While outwardly the burden of barrenness is removed in such a process, inwardly the paramount importance of biological relatedness seems to gradually vanish and become a convenient meat to uphold in the mind of its users. We have uh, Dr. Shirin Nayef listed to be speaking next. Unfortunately, Dr. Nayef was unable to make the journey to Doha. Um, so we've conferred <laughs> as a panel, and uh, Dr. Zainab El Bernoussi um, from Al Akhawen University in Morocco will be speaking next. She will be presenting a paper titled DNA Testing and Islamic Law, an example from Morocco. And I should just add that uh, Professor El Bernoussi will also be reading uh, Professor Nayef's uh, paper uh, to conclude the session afterwards. First, I'm grateful to Dr. Ayman Shabana for his invitation to be a party in this international symposium. Dr. Shabana's work has helped me in my own research on bioethics in the Muslim world, particularly um, to be able to understand what I think are useful and insightful innovations and developments of Islamic jurisprudence in Egypt that ought to serve as a model, particularly in places like Morocco. My growing interest in questions of Islamic bioethics was triggered by my interest in demands of dignity in the Arab Spring, particularly looking at uh, Egypt and later on other parts of the region. Dignity is a concept that may appear as ambiguous, vague, and seem to connotate something fluffy rather than some sort of clearly defined concept. Despite disagreements on understandings of dignity, so first uh, part of disagreements uh, is about uh, the need of the concept in itself, i.e. some rejecting the concept altogether as bringing anything useful. And there is also another disagreement regarding the nature of dignity, i.e. whether it is uh, inherent or extrinsic to humanity, so that is an ontological debate. But in any case, dignity is needed in discussing bioethics because it has become widely recognized as the source of human rights. People as humans have rights in the eyes of the law because of a so-called uh, uh, value they have thanks to dignity. So this is a still background. I'm here uh, contributing on regional perspectives and shedding light on the case of a paternity lawsuit in Morocco involving DNA evidence. So regarding the agenda for this contribution, I would like to first introduce uh, the topic of DNA tests uh, in Islamic law in Morocco, meaning here painting uh, the relevant background. Then I would like to present what is a historic case in Morocco in which a judge in Tangiers recognized paternity in the case of a child born out of wedlock. This is an ongoing case. Lastly, I would like to start a discussion on the implications this particular case uh, and other cases in Morocco have on family structure, so similar cases. So the use of DNA tests in Morocco is quite limited to uh, homicide cases. In a few cases, DNA was used, like uh, the infamous case of the notable businesswoman Hind Ashabi, who had been imprisoned uh, for adultery and served two years in uh, uh, prison uh, before being released uh, in August 2018. In her judgment, the a DNA test has been used to, pre, to prove the alleged illegitimacy of her two children. 
In Morocco, sexual intercourse outside of marriage is very taboo and socially condemned, and the discussion of paternity is quickly turned down in case of children born out of wedlock. Since it is perceived that these offspring have no legitimacy in Islam, such children are often not defended in courts. If a case of paternity claim outside of marriage is brought uh, to court, it often leads to the condemnation of both parties to at least a uh, one month suspended prison sentence, and much more if one of the parties uh, are uh, uh, married. So usually plaintiffs shy away from court use. Now looking at the case. So last year, the Tangier's first instance uh, family court allowed for DNA tests to be admitted into evidence in family law uh, cases. The plaintiff was a mother who wanted to prove the paternity, bunua and lineage, nasab, of her daughter bought, born out of wedlock. Uh, paternity defines the legal relationship between a father and his biological or adopted uh, uh, children. So recognition of paternity can give access to recognition of lineage, inheritance rights, and child support and custody. Lineage, on the other hand, is relevant to the legitimacy of the relationship between a father and his children and would give uh, to the children, as a result, rights to the putative father's title, names, and surnames. So in uh, the plaintiff's paternity suit, she, she uh, sought um, child support in the amount of an estimated uh, 2,000 Moroccan dirhams, which is the equivalent of 210 US dollars, to cover uh, the period since the child birth on November 27, 2014, until the time of the suit. So ultimately, the court dismissed the child support claim, given that paternity had not been established. In a historic move, the first, the, this court, the Tangier First Instance Family Court, recognized the familial relationship, kinship, that connects the biological father to his bio biological daughter without recognizing uh, his paternity. Kinship is the recognition of a tie between the child and the adult without assigning the parental responsibilities that come with recognizing paternity. Kinship applies in general to blood uh, relations between uh, uh, any two people, such as parents and child, or uh, to siblings. In some countries, proof of paternity can determine heirs uh, when there is no written will. In Morocco, however, recognizing paternity outside of wedlock was relatively unheard of due to the common practice of considering kinship in conjunction uh, with lineage and uh, the associated rights uh, to title, names, and, and so on. In, the case, in this case, the Moroccan court did not make a paternity determination but recognized the lineage between the father and the child and required the father to bear some financial responsibility because of this basic relationship. So there was a bit of a twist. Accordingly, the court ordered the father to pay 100,000 Moroccan dirhams, so about 10,500 US dollars, to the child through her mother for the material and moral harms based on chapter three, article 77 of the codes of obligations and contracts, so borrowed from contract law. On October 9th, 2017, the Court of Appeals, so later on, in Tangier reversed the first instance decision. The appeals court denied the merits, the sawab, of the case and declared it void due to the bad faith action of both the plaintiff and the defendant by virtue of their relationship. Of, of their relations, so we're going back to here uh, 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 the idea of zina, concluding that liability could not be attached to one party, be and um, also because the case had been brought by the mother, the court instructed her to pay all court fees. So while conceding that Morocco had signed international convention on children's rights, the court stressed that Morocco had not signed the European Convention on the legal status of children born out of wedlock, which could have presented a stronger case of an international convention in support of the lower court's opinion. 
Instead, the appeals court cited Sunnah, so prophetic uh, tradition, in support of its finding, anchoring the discussion in Islamic law as the primary source of the Moroccan family code. The court cited the reported saying from the Prophet Muhammad, a hadith and legal canon, that the child belongs to the marriage, uh, the marriage bed and the adulterer receives the stone, and I thank Dr. Muhammad Fadl for an important correction. Um, the court also used a quote from the 11th century uh, Andalusian jurist Ibn Hazm that discussed denying any rights to a child born from zina, uh, extramarital sex. Um, here I quote, the child born from an extramarital sex cannot be linked to his father. He does not inherit from his father, and the father does not inherit from the child. The child has no rights on the father, no claims on pension, no claims on prohibitions, or any other rights. He is a stranger to him. So here further cites in Ibn Hazm, the court added that the child is legally so foreign to her father that their marriage is not prohibited. Finally, the court cited Article 148 of the Muduwana, so the Moroccan family uh, status code, as, the, as had also the lower court, to stress that the illegal coupling had no effect, uh, no legal effect that would result in granting the child any rights. So the latest decision was a huge disappointment to hopes that this was a historic uh, turn in Islamic law in Morocco and DNA use on paternity lawsuits. Now let's step back and deconstruct this unique case in Morocco. So it's far from being a norm, but it can set a precedent. How is it unique? Well, the plaintiff, the young uh, mother here, has dual citizenship, Moroccan and Spanish, and was described as very brave and like uh, your so-called average Moroccan woman. Um, there is the obvious context of globalization and uh, also a uh, perception of Moroccan uh, uh, tradition to embrace international cooperation. So Morocco boasts such identity of being open to the West, and that translates into several international conventions, treaties, and agreements uh, signed by the kingdom. International law, therefore, had played a significant role in uh, the first decision and was even used in the second one. In reaching its, in, uh, the conclusion, the court cited the European Convention on the Exercise of Children's Rights and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, both of which have been ratified by Morocco. The court also stressed the primacy of international conventions signed by Morocco over domestic law. Uh, so this is also constitutionalized. Um, there is also some limitation on placing international convention above domestic law. Uh, so again, in the constitution, uh, there is a provision that establishes hierarchy found uh, there, uh, meaning that as long as uh, these <coughs> principles of international law respect national identity. This means that in cases of conflict with so-called national identity, domestic law prevails. Moroccan legislation on Islamic law supports this exception. For example, Morocco recognizes a, a principle of equality between men and women in both the constitution and international convention it, has, uh, it had uh, ratified, but upholds the Islamic system of inheritance that differentiates between inheritance shares uh, uh, based on gender. The plaintiff, because of her European uh, citizenship, was also backed by Spanish uh, and European organizations that even helped her pay uh, for the costly DNA tests, particularly for Moroccan standards. Not all hope is uh, gone for making a historic uh, turn for such cases as the plaintiff appealed the, the uh, decision of the Court of Appeals and the case has now uh, reached uh, the ultimate uh, judicial level, i.e. the Supreme Court or uh, Cour de Cassation. The hope among those concerned with the protection of women and children is that this case will stir a historic debate over paternal accountability, gender parity, and children's rights. 
INSAF, a local NGO founded in 1999 that fights for the rights of women and children, launched a petition in support of the plaintiff. The petition will be submitted to the head of the government, members of the two legislative uh, chambers, and to political parties. And uh, also the, the case is now debated uh, uh, online. Um, and when the historic ruling uh, came out, some Moroccan magistrates expressed skepticism about the ruling and expected it to be overruled. So that was expected. Others thought it was audacious and applauded it. There was a similar divide among uh, uh, people, let's say, in, 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 uh, um, uh, in the wider uh, society. INSAF estimates that every year in Morocco, 30,000 children are born out of wedlock, and most of them are not recognized by their biological fathers. The Ministry of Solidarity, Equality, Family, and Social Development, Basi Mahkawi, the only woman minister in the current cabinet, has recently supported the use of DNA tests to prove the biological link between a child and the conceiver. This has not led to a legislative move yet, but it could do so, uh, particularly given that Minister Hakawi is from the ruling uh, Justice and Development Party, PJD. Um, she also stated the importance of state protection for all children, regardless of their family status. And that's also in the Constitution. Dr. Ahmed Risouni, a Moroccan Islamist, jurist, and former head of the Movement of Unity and Reform, uh, a branch of uh, the very same PJD, is usually considered a conservative and, and reserved man, but he spoke in favor of the plaintiff's case. He thinks we should not uh, still be using shaba or physical resemblance in Morocco as evidence for paternity when there are far more trusted techniques which give yaqeen in the sense of uh, certainty like DNA tests. So now some conclusions. Well, um, in the past, the practice in both urban and rural areas in Morocco was to save face in cases of unwed pregnant women. The goal was to marry them quickly to avoid social shaming in one's community. In Fez, for instance, one of the religious cities in Morocco, one of the claims, uh, what I also call family talk, was that young, unwed pregnant women from rural areas would try to come to work as maids in wealthier families and accuse a young bachelor of impregnating them. So in fears of shaming, the young woman would be married to the wealthy uh, bachelor. Um, in here, the young man would be wrongly held responsible, uh, which is unethical, but the child and the young woman would benefit from the support of the family and the community. Of course, this is just one group of examples, and there are other examples of exploitation from the other way around. Today, the common judicial practice in Morocco is to reject recognition of paternity outside of wedlock because classical Islamic law's recognition of paternity requires courts to give the child's father, uh, the, the child, the father's uh, family name and rights to inheritance. We are in a more individualistic context that favors further fragmentation of the family and the community through the power of law. The Mudawana's article regarding uh, paternity distinguished between legal paternity, which protects the man, and illegal paternity, which punishes the woman. And this disproportionately protects men at the expense of women and children. In contrast to motherhood, fatherhood can be more easily denied without DNA tests. As of now, there is an illegality that was left in this case, that of denying a Moroccan child her rights to moral and material protection by the state as guaranteed by Article 32 of the 2011 Moroccan Constitution. A court ruling in favor of the child will solve at least partially uh, uh, later. And thank you. Professor al Nuthi has also very kindly agreed to um, read uh, uh, Dr. Shirin Naif's uh, article titled Bioethics and Religious Law, Fiqh, The Principle of Doing Good Deed and Its Applications in Contemporary Reproductive Practices. Thank you. So now I am Shirin. I am presenting on behalf of Dr. Sherin Naif, who unfortunately was not able to join us because of an injury. 
the title is Bioethics and Religion, Religious Law, Fiqh, the Principle of Doing Good Deed and Its Applications uh, in Contemporary Reproductive Practice. The theme of my presentation is the importance of discussing the benevolent good deeds and explaining it as well as institutionalizing its values in the field of bioethics. Bioethics, in the widest uh, meaning, is a field of research by an interdisciplinary approach um, that deals with ethical issues about responsible using of bio biological and medical innovations and their influence on humans and the environment. Although developments in medical sciences and technologies, such as in assisted reproduction and organ transplantation, transplantation, have provided significant medical and health achievements, they have also caused various ethical challenges and conflicts that locate within the bioethical discussions. One of these challenges is the monetary relationship between those pay, playing a role in these uh, procedures. In this paper, first, I refer to the approaches that deal with the monetary relationships in the field of bioethics. Over the past 10 years, my study has examined the regulations and implementation of assisted reproductive technologies in Iran. Then, based on the vast observation that I have done in Iran, I discuss the ethical challenges of this field. Focusing on the notions extracted from the traditions of Ira Iranian society and Islamic jurisprudence, such as religious reward, sawab, benevolent deed, amr, ikh, amr khair, wage, uzrat, religious vow, nazr, and bilateral donation, dad or dahish. Okay. That was new to me, that last word. Okay. <laughs> and emphasizing on the importance of charity organizations that concentrate on the healthcare in Iran. I try to suggest solutions to these ethical challenges. In general, there are two main theoretical approaches to this subject. The dominant approach considers the monetary relation in organ and tissue donation uh, morally wrong as the instrumental use of human being as, is, as inconsistent to human dignity. This approach, which is found in many theoretical and ethical discussion, discussions about blood and organ donation, as well as assisted reproduction, considers any monetary relationship and selling and buying human organs morally unacceptable and leading to commercializing human relations and exploiting the poor. It defines just the altru altruistic humanitarian and non-paid uh, donation morally acceptable. For instance, one of the first articles written in the field of medical ethics on this issue is one by John Cohn in 1997. It discusses blood donation in Europe in which he believes that unpaid donation of blood without asking money and reward will lead to consolidation of altruism and solidarity in society. Although this approach is presented within secular ethical discourses, I do believe that it is rooted in the ethical teachings of Christianity in which altruistic giving, love and compassion to others are emphasized more than resolving the financial problems of the needed people um, and the poor in order to improve the social life and developing the social justice, which is the theoretical uh, base of, for the notion of the good in Islam. The second approach defines the monetary uh, relationship uh, and paying money for receiving organs and uh, human sexual cells or using surrogacy in the context of the relations found in the free market. Principle of freedom of contracts and rule of mutual wills thus does not believe in the uh, morally wrongness of such a monetary relation. John Harris, professor of law and bioethic, uh, bioethics at the University of Manchester, whom I have joined uh, two of his seminars at the university um, in 2011, is one of the most important figures of this approach. 
The third approach, which has been uh, less discussed in bioethics, but seems to be the one that many Shia religious legal authorities have chosen, does not prohibit such monetary relationship and financial compensation for participants. For me, this is a rational approach and should be analyzed both theoretically and practically. Shia authorities have discussed the issue of selling and buying the human organs under the title of the uh, new appeared issues, Al Masail Al Mustahditha. Their ideas of this subject can be categorized in two groups. Some of them believe in the legitimacy of financial compensation for tissue or organ donation, while others uh, believe that it is religiously unlawful, haram. Here, I am not intended to, uh, I don't intend to discuss these religious verdicts, fatwas, in the auspice of Shia jurisprudence. Rather, I am interested in the point that a large number of Shia religious legal authorities consider payment for the donation of organs, gametes, embryos, and even surrogacy lawful, halal, and in, define the paid wage, uh, the, the paid money as a wage. These religious legal scholars emphasize that one who gives his her organ and receives money should consider the money as a reward to what she, he does and not as the cost of selling or renting his, her organ. For instance, a, uter a uterus. In other words, for the Shia scholars, the meaning of paying the wage for organ transplantation is paying to the third person due to his her act of donation based on uh, his, her skill and proficiency as uh, she deserves such pain. The amount of pain should be determined by the consent of both giver and receiver of the human organ and tissue. Noteworthy to say, one can follow this perspective in the Shia classical, classical text. For instance, in the case of breastfeeding, when a, a milk mother takes the responsibility of breastfeeding of an infant, it is mentioned that, uh, the, mother that the milk mother should be uh, paid and parents of the infant should observe her rights. That is to say, at the normative level, altruistic uh, giving and financial compensation can constitute a good without contradicting uh, each other. This is an important point in understanding and developing the benevolent deed in Islamic Iranian tradition. For me, it differentiates itself from the other approaches that I wish uh, to be able to develop uh, in, in, this in this argument, in this paper. To focus on the case of Iran, although there have been important developments in the process of lawmaking in Iran about these issues, that have been the result of cooperation among lawyers, religious authorities, and physicians. A large number of ethical challenges have uh, remained unsolved and neglected. One of the most important ethical challenges is the excessive commercialization of the practice. Here I provide an example from my ethnographic uh, field work conducted in Iran over a long period of time. I refer to the case of surrog surrogacy. As I have described elsewhere, according to both civil and religious law in Iran, surrog surrogacy arrangements are permissible and socially accepted. It is only allowed for f infertile married couples and the payment to the surrogate is appropriate. The infertility clinics have their own internal regulations, which include a contract between intended infertile couple and the surrogate woman and her husband if uh, she is married. The intended couple can either introduce a, sur uh, a surrogate to the infertility clinic or they can seek help from the clinic itself. On the normative level, many religious authorities and lawmakers have publicly declared that in the case of lacking um, uterus and when women cannot carry embryo normally, the couples can use surrogacy. The majority of Shia scholars hold the opinion that the producer of the ovum should be considered the mother. Even more, they believe that it is permissible to pay the surrogate mother 
who carries the embryo for nine months. As I referred before, the important point is the religious legal meaning of this pain in this procedure. The money that is paid to the surrogate mother in its theoretical frame is not for renting her uterus, but is a reward which is paid as thanking the benevolent good that the surrogate mother has done by carrying the embryo. On the practical level, my findings are divided in two, uh, into two periods. The first period belongs to the initial years of using these reproductive technologies in Iran, which approximately coincides with the enactment of embryo donation law in the early 2000s. In 2003, the first Iranian law concerning assisted reproductive technology was passed in the Iranian parliament, permitting embryo donation and surrogacy to infertile uh, couples. In these years, most of the surrogate mothers were members of the same families, including a sister, a close relative or a friend of the infertile women. There were also strangers who become acquainted with the infertile ones by friends, neighbors, or workers at the infertility clinics who had heard about the case. Some others have been introduced to the infertile couples by the charity uh, organizations. Religious activists who hold religious ceremonies or clergies uh, who lead prayers at mosques as well. Except for relatives and friends, other surrogate mothers and gamete donors, but not necessarily all from poor or rural backgrounds, uh, many also from the middle class, stated that they had many financial motivations to enter this job. However, they understand uh, they understood it as an ethical and altruistic act and defined it as a gift to such families and uh, a would-be mother that suffered from infertility. Many of them believed that the money that they had received by this work was religiously legitimate, halal, and blessed, muti barik, and deserved the otherworldly reward, sawab. They prefer this work to many other unethical vocations prevailing uh, in the uh, Iranian society. By such a philanthropic deed, Amr Khair, their financial needs, as well as the problem of an infertile uh, couple, had been resolved. My ethnography also shows that those infertile couples, poor, middle class, and wealthy, were talking about uh, such a financial transaction as compensation of philanthropic act. They had different ideas about the amount of money that they had paid, but unanimously expressed an internal satisfaction to pay this money that had solved the, the financial problems or wishes of a needy person or family. Most of the prayers were mentioning the ways their payments had been spent by gamete donors and surrogate mothers. Put it differently, they did not reduce this process to a business contract. It shows that although on one hand this, procedures, this procedure starts with the financial need, wish, of a family or a person, and the hope of having a child from another family on the other hand, but it goes on along a complicated relationship, ethically and emotionally, in which the financial relationship does not decrease the value of the philanthropy found in it. Otherwise, here, um, there is no talk of selling and buying, but a sympathy to solve the problems of other ones, financial and emotional needs, uh, hope, religious vows for problems to be solved. The benevolent uh, good deeds mutual, uh, or solve mutual needs of humans and the continuity and production of human relations and values. For me, this is one of the best embodiments of the bilateral donation, dad or dahish, which is a basis of Iranian cosmology. These cases and experiences I observed through all these years of my research indicate that surrogacy is a practical solution and can help to strengthen the structure of a family. However, during the second stage of my research, which belonged to the early years of 2010s, so the first decade onward, these embodiments of donation and reception have almost disappeared. 
penetration and development of neoliberal values in Iran, as well as institutionalization of dealership culture, Farahang e Dalali. Dalali, yeah. Dalali. I am Dalali, yeah. All right. Informal and non formal organizations have led to over commercialization of the practice. In other words, the issue that can be considered as the most important ethical challenges of using medical technologies is the excessive commercialization of the healthcare and constituting mediators, vasita, that in the recent years have caused new ethical issues in this process and have given rise to new problems in the field of infertility treatment, treatments for both recipients and donors, many of whom have similar socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. These mediators either formally work in some clinics or informally work with some clinics and doctors. Although in the early years of the practice of IVF, gamete donors and surrogate mothers were introduced to the infertile couples, but those did not benefit financially from this process and were mainly motivated by benevolent stimuli. In the recent years, there are mediators who introduce the gamete donors and surrogate mothers to the clinics and infertile couples to gain money. They also give administrative consultations to the couples, help them sign a contract and determine the amount of money that should be paid. That is to say, such a commercializing atmosphere of most of the clinics and relations in the recent years have streamlined, shaping and developing another social phenomena that has generally, generally, but not completely caused a large number of morally wrong activities. <laughs> what happens here is not only a mission of the benevolent deed in the mind and practice of people, but also fraud, gaining money by the illegitimate, illegitimate way and false pricing of human organs and tissues leading to the elimination of human relations, which is essential to establishment and advancement of social justice in any society. Here I want to return to the necessity of a return to the benevolent deeds and as an ethical principle in theory and practice, encouraging benefactors and charity organizations to take the responsibility of humans, uh, human needs in the field of healthcare, such as benevolent uh, introducing of donors to the needed ones can be considered as part of this necessity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to uh, the last session uh, today. Uh, hopefully the last but not least. Um, I am Mohammed Ghali from the College of Islamic Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University. It's my pleasure to moderate this session. We have three presentations. We start with implementation of genetic and reproductive technologies in Qatar, which will be presented by Dr. Ayman Shabana from Georgetown University in Qatar here. Thank right, you. thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, and thank you all for staying uh, up until now. That is, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, implementation of genetic and reproductive technologies in Qatar, and this has been, uh, this presentation is part of a larger work that was generated from the, uh, the a grant with almost the same title which I talked about uh, this morning, if you were here. So this uh, grant funded project aims to look at this theme basically from different uh, angles or dimensions, uh, juristic discourses, uh, positive legal uh, uh, frameworks in terms of legislation, policies, ministerial decrees, uh, but also uh, social scientific or empirical uh, dimension. So we wanted also to look at how these technologies are imp implemented in the real world. I'm not an anthropologist, but fortunately, uh, last year, we had a colleague from the University of Kentucky. She's an anthropologist, so she was here for uh, several months, and we worked together uh, to basically explore that empirical dimension of uh, the issue. So what we uh, uh, did was we uh, conducted a series of interviews uh, here in Qatar, 
uh, with the goal of basically learning more about uh, how people uh, grapple with, with, uh, with these issues, with these questions, with these dilemmas. I have to admit that we had a difficulty recruiting uh, uh, patients or users themselves, and uh, for uh, convenience, uh, more or less, we found it easier to speak to professionals. So we basically limited the scope, at least of this presentation. I see some people nodding, so perhaps they can relate to what I'm saying. Uh, we limited the scope, at least of this, presentation to medical professionals. So we wanted to meet with them to learn uh, about their experience, how they are administering these technologies, how they are grappling especially with the uh, moral and ethical questions surrounding uh, these emerging uh, technologies. And through these interviews, you know, we, we uh, wanted to learn more about the larger impact of these technologies in the society, in, in culture, in, uh, and also impact on, on uh, the, the overall legal and ethical and moral framework as well. So uh, for at least someone like me who uh, comes mainly from an Islamic legal background, you come with the assumption that, okay, people, when they are handling these questions, they basically uh, they do that according to uh, you know a certain legal or moral uh, framework or or paradigm. But after you you do this, and of course I have been reading the anthropological literature as well. Uh, but it, it has been really an eye-opening experience. As I was uh, speaking to to some colleagues earlier today, to actually go out and 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 see how these things are implemented. So you get to see the interplay between theory and practice, how much uh, theory impacts practice, but also oftentimes, as we heard this morning, uh, practice also uh, in, impacts theory somehow. So, so this field work that we did uh, was in the form of structured interviews with medical professionals, medical professionals from uh, basically the wider area of obstetrics and gynecology, uh, assisted reproduction, and also genetic counseling. In total, uh, we had three in, uh, 13 individual interviews and three group interviews. The work was uh, done uh, largely in the period between January and May 2018. And uh, the group interviews, basically some of the professions were quite uh, generous and uh, they, they were quite kind, so they offered uh, not only to meet with us, but also to bring their <laughs> colleagues. So in, in these three meetings, at, uh, interviews uh, at least, we had the chance to meet a panel, if you will, uh, in, in, in several uh, departments, as I will explain later on. So what emerges out of this uh, research, uh, when we, uh, of course, after we did that, we, we transcribed them and, 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 and we started, we are in the process of analyzing them, we're not done yet, but at least we, uh, we started. So some of the main emerging themes that we found were these five uh, themes. Conceptualization, how these technologies are conceived, how they are conceptualized, uh, both by the professionals and through them uh, by the patients as well. Um, regulation, how they are regulated, how they are administered, what are the uh, current uh, applicable frameworks, if you will, legal, moral, ethical, uh, etc. Changes they have introduced in the culture and society, in people's perception, and uh, implications and future prospects and gaps. Uh, in this uh, presentation, I'll be talking more about conceptualization, regulation, and to some extent some change, uh, changes, and also some gaps. So in terms of conceptualization of uh, these genetic and productive technologies, uh, we see uh, that doesn't come as a surprise. Already we have heard a lot uh, today about how assisted reduction or assisted reductive technologies have been embraced uh, quite enthusiastically uh, in Muslim-majority countries. Uh, 
there is uh, almost ijma' on that, <laughs> ijma' of the anthropologists uh, in, in the different uh, regions. But uh, how they are conceived and also implemented in Qatar is governed by uh, certain factors. Uh, one of them is the overall religious and cultural uh, norms uh, that tend to emphasize procreation. Earlier, we heard from uh, Dr. Fadl how uh, celibacy or you know, uh, singlehood is not perceived as the norm from the Islamic point of view. But not only that, there is also emphasis on procreation, producing children. There are various references in the Quran and the prophetic sunnah that talk about the importance of uh, you know, having children, you know, and, and more of them. If, of course, if you are able to to, to care for them, of course. Um, so that larger framework is 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 informed, inspired by by important religious uh, norms, but also cultural norms, especially in this region that appreciates you know procreation quite a lot to the extent that uh, not having children is is seen really uh, is seen as a problem. Uh, to the extent, as, as we heard in some interviews from some medical professionals, that people would do anything to, 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 to have children, to carry the name for inheritance, for economic reasons, for social reasons, for cultural reasons, you know, um, you name it. But there is also something we heard uh, about uh, this morning in, in other regions. This is the pro-natalist policies, and I think this, that exists here in Qatar, uh, mainly due to the uh, marked imbalance between you know uh, citizens and non-citizens. So there is a felt need to basically support Qataris to reproduce, to procreate, uh, because uh, uh, basically uh, of of the, the the numbers basically. Uh, in terms of support uh, or financial support that is given uh, from the, the the state to patients basically to uh, to utilize these technologies. Uh, uh, many people would say this is quite unlimited. So there is almost unlimited support uh, to people to basically, if they want, to explore and avail themselves of these technologies, uh, they can do that. Partial or, or full uh, insurance. Uh, definitely, uh, we were told also that uh, in, in many instances, especially in, in the public sector when it comes to non qataris uh, the cost is not is considered the, the lowest you know in compared with other countries in the region and beyond so all that boils down to state subsidies so these services services are heavily subsidized by the government but not, not only in that area we, we learn also that this is uh, you can see echoes in, in other uh, in the in the health sector in in general where um, medical services or healthcare is offered almost, you know, with 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 minimal cost, uh, if uh, if any, both to Qataris and, and non Qataris through the the healthcare uh, system at Hamad. So the dominant religious and cultural framework framework in Qatar um, uh, also tells us about uh, the fact that these applications are available for heterosexual married couples. So the, of course, uh, other non-standard uh, family types or relationships are out of the question. So they, they, when they are administered, when they are uh, offered, uh, it's assumed that they are offered only to heterosexual married couples. Assisted reduction involves biogenetic materials of married uh, couples only. This is also very important, and we heard earlier about the question of uh, gamete donation and, uh, and and the multiple questions it, and problems and challenges that 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 raises. And uh, and here, of course, uh, given the fact that Qatar is a dominantly Sunni uh, country, uh, they they don't entertain these uh, these possibilities. So these are two very important. Uh, Factors or points to keep in mind when you think about uh, administration or application of uh, uh, genetic and reductive technologies in Qatar uh, applied to who, and also when it comes to IVF and other related procedures, gamete donation is not uh, is not allowed at all. 
In fact, as we will learn later on <clears throat> uh, in the lab at Hamad, they implement what they call double witness policy, that each and every step has to be uh, administered or witnessed by, by two different individuals. And this is recorded and it's documented, just to give the impression that, that what goes on in the lab is, is, is uh, completely according to you know, Islamic law and also in line with uh, general cultural expectations. So we heard a lot about how people, even if they afford going to uh, the private sector or going abroad, <clears throat> they trust Hamad only because they, they have this perception or impression that practice in Hamad is trusted, right? That they can trust that place. So in general, again, uh, you can see here in this, in this presentation uh, many echoes to uh, many things that were, were mentioned in previous presentations. Uh, earlier, we, we heard from uh, Dr. Uh, in Macolada de Martin about how these technologies overall, not just in, I, I don't know, I was not clear whether you meant within Muslim majority country or all, all over, whether they work to confirm or to support dominant cultural um, norms rather than the opposite, which is usually the, the presumption. But definitely in this case, we see that these technologies w work to uh, basically emphasize dominant cultural norms and, and, uh, and, and expectations when it comes to helping people, for example, maintain their marriage, helping people meet cultural expectations by having children, especially for those who can't, uh, rather than uh, lead to the creation of uh, non-standard kind of family types or, or relationships. So something we often heard during these interviews was that uh, these technologies give hope to the hopeless. Uh, they increase the sense of belonging and social happiness. It was very interesting to see how, as people, that is medical professionals, uh, when they say things like that, we, we tended to ask them questions about what intrigued them into this area to begin with. Why did they choose? you know, to, to practice uh, assisted reduction, uh, apart from the financial sector. We know that this is a very lucrative business, but, you know, other medical specialists could be also as lucrative, if not more, but oftentimes the answer that we got was, we are in the business of happiness, you know. Uh, compare this with oncology, for example, you know, this is very depressing, you know, etc. but here you are actually creating life, you know, they say something along these lines. So this is very important to them, you know, at, at the personal uh, level. Also, these technologies, talking about how they are seen in positive light, these technologies are seen as actually working with the state, supporting state policies to protect the family, which is sometimes perceived by some as being under threat. Under threat as uh, some... Uh, as the fertility rates in indicate, as uh, Dr. Inhorn indicated uh, when this, she showed the, the charts about the declining fertility rates uh, throughout, uh, the increasing divorce rate, so by utilizing these technologies, people can avoid that, they can save their marriages, uh, and also they can somehow tip the, no, try to, to, to improve you know, the, the current imbalance uh, between citizens and non-citizens, uh, at least somehow. Apart from that, these technologies help couples achieve individual goals and meet cultural expectations when uh, they overcome infertility problems, obviously. Uh, uh, so before these technologies, at least some, in some cases, it was uh, quite impossible for some to, to conceive, so that uh, that is quite significant. Provide options other than adoption. Before that, uh, for some people, adoption was almost the only uh, alternative or option. Uh, we talked already about divorce and marriage. So many anthropologists already uh, indicated that genetic and productive technologies in Muslim majority countries uh, work to reproduce what is normal rather than challenge established family uh, structures. 
Not to say, as I indicate later in some of the slides, that these professionals are not aware that uh, sometimes by utilizing these technologies, you might be walking uh, down the slippery slope. Uh, oftentimes, we, 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 we heard you know, comments on that, but for the most part, uh, most of them actually uh, emphasize that, that aspect rather than the other. So they are not used merely to overcome uh, infertility. And, and this is a, something very important that we came across that uh, in terms of conceptualization, that these at least reproductive technologies and increasingly with the involvement of genetic applications as well, they are not just used by those who suffer from infertility problems, but increasingly they are used by normal couples who can produce or reproduce naturally, but they resort to something like IVF in order to increase family size. So in, instead of having one child, they want to have two, or even three, and, and even more. So uh, some people were actually talking about this emerging trend becoming the new social norm, right? Another uh, emerging trend, and we heard about this uh, this morning as well, how th these reproductive technologies are increasingly used uh, to select, and oftentimes select for you know uh, male fetuses or children, uh, uh, not not females. So we can see that this is uh, a trend that is taking over, not just in this region, but almost worldwide. You know, uh, there were some reports uh, in, in Asia, in India in particular, and, and other, other uh, contexts. So that particular conceptualization of IVF, or, or reprogenetics in, in general, uh, in, in helping people increase family size and also pre-select the sex of their uh, fetuses uh, was, uh, was quite uh, interesting to, to kind of uh, uh, find here in Qatar as well. Another uh, important uh, phenomenon we, we came across was how couples pursued uh, IVF treatment soon after you know, their marriage. So the, many professionals, especially, you know, Qatar is a very diverse country. It's small but quite diverse, and I would say you know, people in, in the medical sector, for example, they come from all over the, the world, basically. They come from Muslim-majority countries, non-Muslim-majority countries. Uh, but even those who are not Muslims, they have experience with Muslim patients elsewhere. Uh, and they say, that based on our experience, we heard that quite often, that over here in, in, in Qatar, people resort to IVF sooner than other places. So in, in general, um, people are supposed to be or assumed to resort to IVF if they suffer from an infertility problem, which is defined medically as a lack of pregnancy after one full year with um, unprotected sex. So these professionals say that uh, you know, they come almost a few months after marriage. If pregnancy doesn't happen, then they, they show up in, in, in our clinics to ask questions, you know, why you know, uh, uh, pregnancy is not happening, uh, et cetera. Oh, five minutes, okay. Thanks so much. Uh, results are not always uh, positive. Uh, this is also something that, uh, just to, to counter this kind of overall general positive perception of genetic and productive technologies, there was also a darker side of that, especially when uh, there are failed cycles, when people are not successful, when uh, there is abortion or termination of pregnancy or something wrong uh, goes on, then oftentimes this is followed by you know uh, sadness, frustration, and depression, not only by women, but also by men. Uh, in terms of regulation, the term regulation is used here in, in this paper and this presentation in, in a more generic term to basically indicate all efforts to define, draw, set boundaries, delineating proper and improper use of these technologies. 
Uh, overall, uh, scholars, legal scholars and, and anthropologists also uh, pointed out that there is a multiplicity of regulatory framework which vary from uh, individual self-regulation all the way to professional measures, to communal measures, legislative measures, or a combination of all of these. Uh, what that translates into, as uh, Soraya was, uh, Dr. Soraya Tremen was indicating, that each country somehow at the end of the day is unique because the, these combinations work differently in different settings. So uh, in terms of self-regulations, uh, that applies both to Muslim patients but also to the Muslim professionals. And the attitude would differ depending on uh, certain factors like religious commitment or socioeconomic standards. Uh, in general, many professionals indicated that Muslims tend to have a strong sense of religious uh, identity, which is reflected in uh, social behavior, and also certain procedures uh, are not uh, discussed, like gamet donation, surrogacy, uh, and, and other more controversial uh, arrangements or, or procedures. Muslim professionals uh, we can see also the same kind of dynamic different positions uh, as Muslim patients, although they are in general, uh, uh, they feel that they are bound by a set of professional ethics, uh, something like autonomy, for example, although it remains susceptible to different interpretations by different professionals. So when it comes to some controversial procedures like, like vasectomy, for example, when we were uh, talking to male infertility uh, professionals, some of them indicated that this is something that they wouldn't do for religious reasons, while others said we could do if we, if the patients uh, wanted it, because we don't see that as, as religiously problematic. So uh, in terms of regulation, I think a lot also depends on the medical setting. Uh, this was an interesting quote that, that one of the professions uh, expressed uh, to indicate the, the, the difference between the public sector and the private sector, that uh, somehow uh, the regulation depends also on, on the setting. So in the public sector, moral and ethical issues are addressed at the institution level. When I say public sector in Qatar, we're basically talking about Hamad Medical Corporation. Uh, and a lot is happening in the, what is called assisted conception unit. It has its own IVF lab and it works closely with the genetics department and also male infertility unit within the urology uh, department. So all these departments or specialities within Hamad, they, they work together when it comes to assisted reproductive technologies. When it comes to private sector, we uh, met with several professionals in the private clinics and although they have to be, of course, licensed by the Ministry of Public uh, Health. We saw that there is a great deal of flexibility within the overall national legal framework. It doesn't specify everything, but it specifies some general boundaries. Within these boundaries, we could see or notice uh, some uh, flexibility when it comes to some procedures like sex selection, for example which is not regulated you know, by law, but it's it is regulated more or less by fatwa, as uh, Dr. Inhorn was indicating earlier. Uh, discussions on that, by the way, goes all the way up to the early 80s, like in the IOMS discussions and other uh, 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 collective uh, uh, juristic uh, councils, uh, deliberations happening there indicate. The IVF lab uh, was established in 1993, as I said, it is considered one of the main re regional centers when it comes to that. Uh, something interesting about how they do their work as I indicated the double witness uh, uh, policy, but they also have some limitations on non-medical PGD or PGS. This is something that they don't under, uh, uh, entertain, and this is something that most people resort to the private sector in order to explore if they are interested in rather than at, at Hamad. In order to do that at Hamad, they need to have a medical reason and they have to go through the ethical committee that was mentioned earlier uh, this morning. In terms of changes, there is a wide range of uh, changes. How much time? I'm done? Okay. All right, there are uh, several interesting changes I can come back to at the QA if you are interested. Uh, in terms of uh, gaps, uh, two main points were highlighted. 
absence of a regulatory body to provide guidance in the area of genetic and reproductive technologies at the national level, this was felt, uh, this was considered a, a, as an important need that, that people need to pay attention to. Uh, also, there is a need for more coordination among various stakeholders in the society. So to conclude, as much as these technologies have introduced solutions, they have also raised important challenging questions. Implementation in Qatar has to, is uh, or has been influenced by the dominant religious, cultural, and political framework. The, in general, they have been used to confirm and support established notions of the family rather than challenge them. On the long term, there is awareness of a need to address deeper ethical questions such as designer babies. Uh, also, there is a need to fill gaps in related policies and more involvement of various stakeholders. Thank you very much. Then we move uh, now immediately to um, uh, Susie Kilshaw from the University College of London, who will present Anxious Production, Reproduction in Qatar, Women's Experiences of Miscarriage. The floor is yours. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much for um, inviting me here today. It's been really an interesting day, and I feel like I've got so many things to, <coughs> to think about. And I'm really pleased. Um, to see that there were some of the similar findings that we found in terms of um, IVF clinics, and I'll comment a little bit about that. So what I wanted to do today is think a little bit further about global discourses and technologies around reproduction, as well as demographic shifts and changing attitudes around fertility and how these shape uh, people's experience. I'm actually going to skip a little bit, just because I know it's been a long day, so I'm gonna try and get through this quite quickly. So what I'm going to be speaking about today is um, a project that I have recently finished, which was looking at women's experience of miscarriage here in Qatar and in England. I just wanted to put up my team members because this was a collaborative project. Nadia was actually here, but she had to go. Um, and it involved clinicians and researchers here in Qatar at Wild Cornell and Hamad Medical um, Corporation, as well as myself and Danny Miller, who are anthropologists at UCL. So miscarriage is an extremely common women's health experience. One in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. But we know that reproductive experiences are largely contingent and shaped by context. Our research revealed that women's experience of miscarriage is embedded in their wider life stories, life trajectories, including their past reproductive experiences, as well as their reproductive aspirations. This personal framework is further embedded in familial, social, and cultural networks of reproductive possibilities, aspirations, expectations, as well as limitations within which women navigate. So just very quickly, I've put some of our methods up there. Now, I think a comparison between these two sites is particularly relevant because of the difference in the social landscapes in which reproduction is embedded. But I also think that it's interesting to see what's happening in places like England as compared to um, somewhere like Qatar because of the way that some of the discourses that come out of places like the UK or Euro America, the USA, can have quite a hegemonic um, and a dominant nature. So I think it's important to see how those are, the differences between them and also how they might be shaping global discourses around reproduction and parenting. So what I'm speaking about today is something a little bit new that I'm um, trying to develop, so it's kind of unformed, so I apologize for that, but I'm really looking forward to taking this further and hearing your comments about it. So what I'm trying to do is make connections between miscarriage, assisted reproductive technologies, and other global reproductive discourses. Now just very quickly, um, this has come up in, in other talks today, but one of the things that we found is that women's experience of miscarriage and reproduction reveals these tensions between two broad Qatari state development pol policies of pronatalism on, on one hand and women's empowerment and their role in economic life and the expe expectations around that. So a little bit about um, miscarriage in Qatar. I should say that in Qatar, I was looking at Qatari nationals. Um, so that's important just to, to point out. So what we found was that in Qatar, miscarriage was typically normalized. It was seen as a sad, but if not uncommon, pregnancy event. Part of this is to do with relatively um, high fertility rates as compared to England, where it's anticipated that some pregnancies, unfortunately, may not end in the, in the 
birth of a healthy child. So I just wanted to put up a couple of quotations from um, people we spoke to. So this is Jamelia, who's 42 years old and the mother of five children who recently miscarried. She said, miscarriage is normal. I saw that lots of women miscarried this month. Also my sister just yesterday, she miscarried. The heartbeat stopped. Many women miscarry. So what you see is Jamila here is, is contextualizing her own loss um, in light of miscarriages that other women that she knew had and, and has the effect of normalizing or at least making her feel not as unusual. Another, um, sorry, can I go back? Oh, no. Um, we also met Nora, who was a 41-year-old mother of six who had recently suffered her first miscarriage. She also explained that miscarriages were, were not um, unusual and that women who miscarried, she said, were not the object of stigma. And her, her husband, this is her husband here, who agreed with her and said, when the woman doesn't get pregnant and doesn't have kids at all, we call her infertile. But when the woman miscarries once or twice, we consider her healthy and fertile. And we found this again and again, that women who miscarry are seen as demonstrating fertility. And this resonates with anthropological, anthropologists' work in other contexts, such as Varley, who found that in northern Pakistan, miscarriages were proof of a woman's ability to, to conceive, or half the battle won. Um, whereas one or two miscarriages over the course of a woman's reproductive life were viewed as normal, five or more was seen as too much and signaled cosmological imbalance or black magic. So miscarriage can be seen as a positive demonstration of fertility and sets women apart from those who are infertile, those who cannot conceive, which I think we've all seen is, is a particularly problematic sort of category um, for, for women and for men. So what we also found was that feelings of culpability around miscarriage were relatively minimal, although women did talk about being worried that they were being blamed by others or there was suspicion of, of, of that maybe they had caused it, but they didn't really feel as though that they were culpable. Qatari women also didn't memorialize or focus on commemoration of their pregnancy or the fetus beyond the fact that all pregnancy remains and tissues are buried, and there's a very standard method of burial. So this differed um, from what I found amongst the women that I was meeting in England. And I should say, and I think this is important to note, that the women in England um, were aren't representative of sort of the broader demographic in England. These women were primarily um, middle class, um, educated, they were almost all white. Um, and one thing that I think is important to note is when we're talking about sort of dominant discourses, and I'll talk about a little later about what's sort of emerging in England, and, and these are the women who in many ways are kind of shaping what we think of pregnancy loss in, in the UK and in England. So what we found was that um, despite the familiarity with this, the statistic of one in four, women consistently understood miscarriage, or at least their miscarriage, to be rare, unusual, and possibly signifying some kind of underlying fertility problem. They actively resisted attempts at normalizing their miscarriage and report feelings of isolation, um, and are often unaware of others who had miscarried. Um, this has been found in other research. Um, for example, Bardos did quite a large study in the US who found similar things. They reported feelings of, of grief and feeling culpable. There was a lot of experience of, of self-blame. Women also describe miscarriage as silence, which they combat with um, acts of memorialization and remembering, like these are two tattoos that women got to remember their miscarriage, um, or they sort of publicize it in different forums. Women consistently spoke of losses, including very early losses, as the loss of a child, a baby, a family member, and someone that should be and needed to be remembered. One of the things that was overwhelming um, about the women that I met in England was that they were pessimistic about their fertility and their reproductive aspirations. And age emerged again and again as something that was really producing a lot of anxiety. So one of the things I was, I've been looking at is whether there's a sort of collapsing of infertility and miscarriage amongst these women where no miscarriage is deemed as normal or acceptable. And also just to point out this overwhelming sense of anxiety about their future reproduction and this uncertainty that they would have children or more children at all. This seemed to really sort of um, take over their experience. Now I should say that despite women reporting silence and taboo around miscarriage in England, I've observed a significant shift in public perceptions in medical care. I think the silence is being eroded thanks to women like these women and also support groups and charities like the Miscarriage Association. We're having increased opportunities and spaces to acknowledge pregnancy loss publicly. 
But I think what we're seeing is this dominant narrative emerging where miscarriage represents a significant loss to be treated as a death that demands memorialization. And I have a lot of um, details that I can't go into, but things like the way that in the UK we've changed the way we handle and dispose of pregnancy remains, for example. Hospitals now provide funeral services. Um, we have Baby Loss Awareness Week, which I, is next week, I think. Um, and medical care is really responding to this sort of shift in, um, in public understandings around miscarriage as loss as a specific kind of loss. Now recently I've been trying, I've been developing an argument in order to make sense of these differences by looking around the theme of control. The women that I spoke to in, in England saw their reproduction as something, as in most parts of their life, that was something to be controlled, planned, and organized. And it was clear that they were doing so to try and minimize risk. Now, Women in Qatar, this issue of control didn't come up. I'm not saying they didn't try and control their reproduction, but it wasn't something that appeared as a, as a main trope. Um, a lot of women say pregnancy, it's normal, that's what happens, that's what I, you know, they sort of said that it wasn't something that they really planned. So in taking this discussion further, I found that Faircloth and Girton's work has been particularly informative. Um, so they've characterized your American climate of reproduction as anxious. And by developing a dialogue between two fields of reproductive research, parenting culture studies on the one hand, and then social and anthropological research around assisted reproductive technologies, they show have normative and moralistic expectations around reproduction, create indiv individuals who need to be ever more reflexive and accountable for their produ reproductive actions and decisions. So they point out that the parenting ideology promoted in much of Northern Euro America is characterized by intensive parenting. Um, and we should point out that a lot of this is particularly around mothers and, and motherhood. What's also been interesting is if you look at assisted reproductive technologies and this kind of parenting, this focus on parenting, it extends temporally backwards to before the child is born. And indeed, others have shown how even before the child is conceived, so for example, in a cultural context in which good parenting is intensive parenting, parental and particularly, particularly maternal responsibility increasingly be begins before conception in ideals and ex expectations and plans. So being in the right relationship, taking prenatal vitamins, eating well, losing weight, all of those sorts of things. And assisted, reproduction, uh, assisted reproductive technologies' its role is very key in this because it's changed the way we've imagined fetuses, babies, children, families, and parents, but also in terms of this temporal shift. So in seeking fertility treatments, couples are expected to account for and embody an intensive commitment to parenting before becoming parents. Once they embark on a treatment, potential mothers or fathers must behave as they were actual mothers and fathers. So we're asking when they engage in this in this sort of um, this technology, we're asking them to be reflexive, forward-thinking, responsible reproducers, sometimes far in advance of the time when they actually will intend to or become parents. So these technologies and this idea around and this sort of focus on parenting, intensive parenting, generates new choices and opportunities. But it also produces more burdens, responsibilities, and accountabilities. And I, what Faircloth and, and Girton and others have shown is that greater anxiety is, is the consequence. There's just more choice, more opportunities, but you also have to be a kind of moral um, decider about which path you take. So I just want you to keep this in mind as I just introduce you to one of our participants. Um, Mozart was a 29-year-old woman, it's not her real name, um, in the main public hospital here, um, which was the main site of our, our project. When we met her, she looked quite frail and fragile, and she was sitting on the bed. And she started describing her most recent miscarriage, which was her second. Having suffered a missed miscarriage, she had been admitted to the hospital for its medical management, which involved administering tablets and, and pessaries of misoprostol. So she described this, the experience, but she became overcome with emotion many times. She said she wanted to keep talking about it, but we did keep taking breaks because she was so emotional. She explained that she was, is her husband's second wife and his first cousin. She married her husband, Khaled, after his wife had died and unfortunately before um, she, was eight, she had children. So her husband uh, remained childless. 
So at 29, um, as we've been hearing, um, Mozo is a, is, was a little bit older than most women, Qatari women, trying for her first baby. So when the couple had not conceived after several months, they were encouraged to seek help. And I think this really fits in with the paper we've just heard, and this is exactly what I found, is there's so much pressure to produce children and sort of to demonstrate fertility um, that if couples don't um, have a baby within a few months, they're usually pressured, encouraged, pushed along to go and seek um, investigations and potentially leading to the use of assisted reproductive technologies. In this case, it was found that um, Khalid had low sperm count and low motility, but Mota um, pointed out that she was frustrated that even though it was seen as it was due to his, to him rather than to her, she said she still felt blamed and explained that women typically bear the brunt of such problems. And I think we've heard this, that um, it's been well documented that women not only bear the brunt of fertility treatments, but also um, the notions of blame, regardless of the cause of any kind of infertility or problems around reproduction. So Mozart and Khalid underwent treatment. Um, and again, what we've heard is it's, um, it's incredibly accessible. It's, um, it's supported by the state. Um, and there's not very many limitations. It, ARTs are enthusiastically used in, in Qatar. And we definitely found that in our research. So unfortunately, the first cycle failed, but the second cycle using a frozen embryo resulted in a pregnancy. But sadly, Mozart um, miscarried after five weeks gestation. So they underwent a third, what they called a fresh cycle, where they went through the whole process again. And again, she became pregnant, but sadly, she miscarried at 11 weeks. Through our discussions, it became clear that she understood her pregnancy to be particularly vulnerable because of its IVF, because it had been um, conceived through IVF. She referred to it as not a normal pregnancy, but an IVF pregnancy. For Mozart and many of the, of the other women I met, um, there was a suggestion that these pregnancies conceived through IVF were more susceptible to risks and needed to be more heavily protected. So two months after her miscarriage, um, she went to an appointment with the, the clinic, um, the IVF clinic, and the doctor reassured her that their problem wasn't that severe and that they would be able to have a, a baby through IVF. The clinician at the time explained that the miscarriage was likely due to a chromosomal abnormality, and at that point, Mozart asked, would it be better to take, go, to, uh, go to Jordan and to undertake the IVF there um, so that she could do some kind of PGD, um, because at that time it wasn't available here. So the question came up, and the doctor said it probably wasn't necessary and to wait until the, the results came back. Some months later, this, this story really sort of stuck with me. I felt very moved by her story because she was, she was so distressed. So we were delighted when we received the information that she was pregnant, and sure enough, a few months later, their son was born. But as I said, Mozart's story really struck with me, and I stuck with me, and I felt very moved because she was sort of so distressed, and, and, and there was a lot of uncertainty, and she was sort of in the middle of this quite fraught story. I later realized that I was so struck by her um, because she seemed different in many ways from the other interviews that we had been doing here in Qatar. Her story also in informed my emerging understanding of Qatari miscarriage experience while also helping me to understand some of the similarities and differences between this, the two sites. Now, I think in some ways, I've, uh, IVF had provided her with hope, but it also had provided her with choice. It also meant an investment in the preg pregnancy, putting her body through sometimes painful treatments. It meant scrutiny and monitoring at a very early stage. She also, through these, these choices and these various choices, she had some notion of kind of controlling her fertility in some ways. Do I go to Jordan? Do I not? Do we do a fresh cycle? Do we use frozen embryos, et cetera? So there's a sense of responsibility as well as we navigate these choices. She also knew of her pregnancy very early on, and she was absorbed in a, a system of surveillance and planning. She had become a preconception pa patient through engagement with the assisted reproductive technologies. So just thinking about um, Mozart's story, I think it's important to, to sort of embed these stories in the, in the social landscape. So one of the things that I think has come up is, is pronatalism and how it's very sort of supported and um, encouraged by the state. So this 
this real need to produce and to prove your fertility. And, and there's also this desire to have children. This access to um, assisted reproduction, as ARTs is, is great, but there's also a real push to use them quite soon. Um, at the same time, with catheterization and development, there's also changes where women are also feeling a lot of pressure to, um, to be educated, to work, and what this then does to what women, the choices that women have to make. So for example, we've seen that women are marrying later, so Moza is reflexive of this. They're having children later, they're having fewer children, and so they're having smaller families. Um, and women talk about not being able to, not wanting to have larger families because of the difficulty in having a job and um, caring for and loving and providing for as many children. Five minutes, okay, great. So just thinking about um, this effect of having smaller families, for example, and I think and Marcia spoke about it earlier, is that I've also found here that although people talk about really wanting to have daughters and, and loving daughters, and maybe daughters might sort of love you and stay with you, there is still this requirement to have a boy. And so we did see that people were talking about the possibility of, of um, undertaking PGD for son selection to, to balance families, because there was a sense that although you might really want girls, you needed a boy to also protect your girls. Um, so just thinking about how all these things come together, and I don't have time to talk about it, but another thing that I think is quite important, and one thing I've seen is be because of, in part because of these smaller families, in part because women are being pushed and pulled in many directions, there's been a real discussion um, amongst inter the interviewees, but also at a state level about parenting. Um, parenting seems to have become more, um, more of an issue. It's gained more attention, I think, in the government and the research domain. Um, and one of these things I've seen is there's a kind of, that comes about around the, um, the role of the maid. So it, issues around anxiety about the increased role of, of maids in caring for uh, children. I, and I think that's potentially this kind of anxiety that the, at the state level, but also at the personal, in the family level, about this anxiety about the influence of, of maids reflects this, the importance of parenting, and particularly mothering, in the continuity of Qatari culture and links with the past. Um, so for example, the Qatar National um, Development Strategy outlined a focusing on wanting to strengthen parental roles. So parenting has become a subject of state concern and has become linked to narratives of national identity and development as, ev as evidenced by a number of government initiatives, I think. So I think with this kind of anxiety about around the role of the, the maids and this kind of worry about maybe family structure um, disintegrating has a lot to do with the role of, of women in the family um, and these sort of these, these shifts. So I think what I'm, I'm trying to, to show is that we, um, Assisted reproductive technologies and a kind of focus on parenting, particularly intensive parenting, um, can suggest that being a good parent is, a, is strategizing and planning and organizing. And I think as we see smaller families becoming the, the norm in Qatar, it suggests that there may be a, a need to or a, a more emphasis on planning and control, and that links to ideas around control over reproduction. Also there may be more focus and investment in each pregnancy and each child, for example. So I wonder if we'll start seeing a shift in terms of miscarriage experience. So will the number of acceptable miscarriages become lower? And I don't want that to sound glib because I'm not saying that women don't find miscarriages upsetting, but there was a real sense that it didn't point to, it wasn't a, a, an ex, a problem. Um, it was seen as something that was acceptable and part of a woman's experience of reproduction in many ways. Um, and I wonder also with the, the ongoing influence of assisted reproductive technologies and newer and newer reproductive technologies such as egg freezing, um, will the notion of parenting and good mothering shift further back to early pregnancy, conception, and preconception? So think of Moza and, and how her engagement with these technologies really sort of 
push this idea back, something that we're seeing in the UK as almost the norm for, for pregnancies. Um, and also thinking about the impact of feelings of culpability. So with these choices and options also comes choice and um, taking con control and also taking a kind of um, responsibility for those choices and the way we navigate. So will that impact feelings of culpability? Um, and I think I'll just finish off by saying, but of course there are always resistances as well. So none of this is, is always just absorbed and taken in. There will, I think there's a number of, of things um, about the way that women experience miscarriage and the way that miscarriage is framed here, which may potentially um, resist such a shift to, um, to what we're seeing in, in England and the UK, but we don't really know what that's going to look like yet. So I'll finish there, thank you. Uh, now we move to the last presentation in this session uh, by Dr. Alexander Kiro at the College of Islamic Studies, Ahmed bin Khalifa University. He will speak on the family as an endangered pillar of society, normative pluralism, and the contradictions of the ethnographic state in the Gulf. Please. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ayman, for organizing this. And I'm delighted to be part of a, um, a panel with scholars whose work has been very instrumental in shaping my own approach to these questions. I approach these issues um, about family structure in the wake of genetic and reproductive technologies from a particular vantage point. As a social scientist, I'm interested um, in thinking about public reasoning, how people reason about things and the structures of justification or the normative commitments that underlie the positions that people take in these public debates. Um, and secondly, I'm interested in thinking about the state, right? How the state, what kinds of instruments does the state have at its disposal to shape debates and policies about the family? Uh, this is briefly the structure of my presentation. So there is a widespread discourse, not only in Qatar, but in the Gulf, that the family is in crisis. And people identify a number of signs of this crisis that include most prominently, of course, soaring divorce rates, um, as well as growing celibacy rates or spinsterhood, uh, decreasing fertility, growing demographic imbalance, etc. These signs are often seen to be symptoms of broader transformations that are taking place, transformations that include loss of relevance of extended family structures, uh, tribalism, um, uh, emergence of new gender roles and expectations. So in Qatar, this has led to what um, Nur al-Malki, who is the executive director of the Doha International Family Institute, has coined uh, the family cohesion agenda. And you have here some of the uh, vehicles um, of this agenda, so Qatar National Development Strategies that very much emphasize the importance of family cohesion and women's empowerment, uh, the reports on cross-national marriages and other uh, dimensions of family life produced by the defeats. Um, the statistics that are collected within, within the Ministry of Development, Planning and Statistics on marriage and divorce that are very much part of this family cohesion agenda. And then for those of you who follow a little bit the religious debates, there's a famous periodical that comes out from Qatar since the 1990s now called Kitab al Umma, where uh, at the Fakhu Kalusari, the family disintegration has featured also quite prominently. Um, so this is my presentation is part of a lively scholarly debate, and that includes some of the scholars that are based here. Um, and the questions that I'm interested in are, are these. So um, in my presentation, I will focus primarily on the first two. So how has the Qatari state intervened in family life and pursued the family cohesion agenda? And more specifically, how has the codification of personal status law, the circulation of modern scientific ideas about family stability and genetic risk, and Wahhabi reinterpretations of Sharia reshaped family, and in particular marriage practices in the Gulf, right? Um, so this is the structure of my paper. Uh, let me start briefly with, um, uh, and the sources that I'm using, with a little bit of, the, uh, give you a sense of what the public debate has been like. Um, I would not normally uh, use Qatari newspapers as example or um, um, of 
um, uh, lively public debates, but on questions of family, actually, um, uh, newspapers are quite useful, even though they're tightly monitored by the state. And what one finds from reading some of these newspapers is this perception of crisis, or at least dysfunction, dysfunctioning family structures, um, a dysfunctioning that is now perceived as a societal problem, right? Because family is now, uh, as the expression goes, uh, a pillar of society and uh, its cohesion and stability uh, basically mirror the cohesion and stability of society. Uh, I highlight this because this is historically, I think, rather new talk about uh, family issues as a pillar of society and the framing of family crisis as a societal issue is something that you would not have found um, in, in, in the Gulf, I think, before the, uh, the mid 20th century, and it's very much part of the emergence of this idea of society also that is, uh, has accompanied processes of state, state formation. Um, so in the debates, it's also quite clear that gender roles are naturalized, um, um, and, and where participants expect women and men to behave differently. Um, there are appeals to tradition that are made in these public debates, but often these appeals to tradition can be readily countered with the claim that ch times have changed, right? So there are demands of modernity that work to offset appeals to tradition. This is important, I think, because the protection of Qatari tradition features quite prominently also in state discourses, um, but its place in family debates is more ambiguous than it might seem. In other words, uh, if, as in the religious talk show that I have here um, below, um, a scholar suggests that perhaps um, consent is not necessarily a, a condition for a flourishing and happy family life or that women should dedicate their life to their husbands and stay at home instead of working, um, and that guardians can arrange marriages for their, uh, for their uh, legal guardians and so on. These kinds of claims will be readily met with um, or, or dismissed with uh, uh, um, observations that times have changed, that women now work, and uh, uh, and that consent is necessary for uh, uh, a happy family life, and therefore the role of the guardian is kind of offset by the uh, necessity of spouses getting to know each other before marrying. Um, the discourse is often very psychologizing, uh, so it deploys a kind of a, a psychological register that focuses on um, the, nece the necessity of controlling individual uh, emotions and states. So uh, spouses in, 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 in discussions about family breakdown, for example, uh, there's rarely um, sociological arguments about new conceptions of masculinity or new understandings of gender roles uh, that, uh, that feature in these debates. It's much more about how uh, individuals need to have patience, self-restraint, trust in God, and so on. And the last point that is kind of hidden, unfortunately, from the PowerPoint is that there are frequently uh, there are frequent appeals to the state for intervention. Right. So the state is seen as the, as the an agency which needs to. Uh, actively uh, intervene into these debates by either um, providing, uh, uh, helping to offset costs of marriage, relieve debt among Qataris, or uh, provide ch childcare facilities for women and help create a better work-family balance, right? Work-family work balance for uh, working women. Um, and so what you have here is a debate from, uh, just an, an example of a debate that in, uh, I don't know if anyone recognizes this character, so in the middle is Sheikh uh, Ahmed al-Bu'aynain, who's a famous uh, religious scholar and, and, and media celebrity who runs this weekly television show called Al-Mutawa in Arayan. Uh, um, on the left there's a judge, a family, a family court judge, and on the right there's a, um, a uh, a, con a consultant who works in this Wifak family consulting center, where where, where 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 any couple has to go to before initiating divorce proceedings. Um, so there's a lot of materials out there to think about uh, uh, the way these debates are framed in public. Um, 
Now, the second issue that I'm interested in has to do with the state, right? So the state, as I mentioned before, is actively called upon to intervene in family affairs. Um, and so how has the state sought to do this? How has the state regulated family life? And how does one go, and how does one go about identifying the state's position? Um, so this is, I think, a familiar methodological problem. Studying the state is not as easy as it might appear, because the state everywhere is a, a set of different agencies who work for sometimes rather different goals. It is a problem that is enhanced in contexts like Qatar, where uh, the state has an incentive to proliferate, and therefore it, it's always possible to co-opt and integrate um, uh, sectors of society by just creating new institutions, right? Um, and this is a, a structural feature of frontier states that cannot be easily addressed simply through a, a, a tightening of policy cohesion. Um, and so this is the kind of state bodies that are engaged in the regulation of family life. Um, so I had some fun collecting some of their logos. So there's, as you can see, there's quite a number of ministries. So there is on the, on the top left a Supreme Council for Family uh, Affairs who has now been disbanded, um, but which was very instrumental under Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa's uh, reign in trying, um, and with the support of Sheikh Hamoza, in trying to organize and regulate family life, but there's also a whole set of other institutions that uh, are engaged in these debates and develop policies and contribute to the uh, discussion. So this includes the Ministry of Culture and Sports, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Awqaf and Religious and Islamic Affairs, and the Ministry of Public Health. Um, and then there are a number of quasi-governmental bodies like DFI, like WIFAC, uh, and statistical uh, 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 organs who, which uh, are also very much uh, engaged in, in these discussions. So um, in order to make sense of these different institutions, what I've done here is I, um, I divide the, st the state into three fields or areas of intervention, law, science, and religion. Right? Uh, it is that the Qatar state exercises legal power, claims scientific authority, and invokes the normativity of Islam in its attempts to regulate family life. Now, these are dynamic and overlapping fields. They correspond more or less to certain institutional locations insofar as like law is the legis legislative branch of the Qatari state, so the Amiri Diwan and the um, Council of Ministers. Science is something that is very much part of the Ministry of Development, Planning, and Statistics as well as the Ministry of Public Health. Um, um, and religion is primarily located within the uh, Ministry of Awqaf and Islamic Affairs, right? So these, um, um, these, are, uh, these three areas or fields of intervention actually are much more uh, overlapping than they might seem at first place. And they are what I call vehicles of normative pluralism. Um, OK. so. Um, I'm interested, so one of the ways in which I think we can explore the way state intervenes is to think about questions of marriage uh, and marriage suitability. Um, and um, in, in the legal field, um, this is done in a number of ways, right? So how does the state intervene uh, legally in the regulation of a family? Well. Already in the Constitution, the family is seen as a pillar of society founded on religious ethics and patriotism. Uh, the state promises to protect the family, support its structure, strength, strengthen its ties, and protect maternity, childhood, and old age. Uh, there are two very important laws if you want to think about the legal regulation of family. The first one is Law 21 of 1989, which regulates marriage to foreigners. So this is part of a regional trend also. And then there's Law 22 of 2006 that promulgates the family law, which until then was not codified. Um, and, and so I'm, I think what, what is interesting about this is um, um, uh, through these legislative moves, the state has actually reduced, adopted, a restricted understanding of kafa'a, but expanded through other considerations um, uh, the conditions that would have traditionally perhaps been subsumed under that concept of kafa'a. So kafa'a briefly is an Islamic legal concept that has been uh, articulated within uh, all four Sunni Islamic juridical schools. Uh, refers to the idea of marriage compatibility, 
right? So the judge uh, needs to uh, ascertain that the wife uh, or, the, or the, the bride is not marrying someone below her social status, right? And so these scholars in, within the Islamic legal tradition have disagreed on what kinds of criteria count uh, for determining kafa'a. Uh, in the family law here, kafa'a is actually, the legislator ado adopts a very narrow definition, right? So kafa'a is only related to deen wa khuluq, right? So to, to religion and morals. And so this is surprising because even in the Hanbali school, which is supposedly the basis of the family law, there are more capacious understandings of kafa'a. Uh, kafa'a as including also nasab and in other, in, in, uh, so in other, in other, in other uh, formulations also um, um, trade, uh, socioeconomic status, and so on. Uh, so. Uh, this is one of the ways in which, so kafa is restricted technically in the law, but the law adds two other considerations, so marriage with foreigners and premarital medical tests that it now requires that, that, that spouses undergo. Um, and so in a sense, what, what I'm trying to suggest is that these, these two uh, points are, can be seen as extensions of, of kafa'a, even though they don't go under that name, right? Uh, with some with some changes. So first of all, the um, uh, laws that regulate marriage with, to foreigners actually focus primarily on males, right? Whereas traditionally kafa'a was concerned about the spa, the, the choices of uh, women. Um, um, uh, the laws that have been enacted not only in Qatar but in the region um, uh, regulating cross-national marriages focus, focus on men. That of course has to be seen in the context of these ethnocratic structures uh, of states here where nationality becomes a key factor and nationality is transmitted through male uh, lineage. Um, uh, so, so, so the the law actually is much more string, uh, stringent in uh, its requirements for men who want to marry non-nationals uh, than it is for women. Um, uh, secondly, I think in the ways in which nasab lineage now become overlooked in the family law, uh, one might see this legislative move as part of the Qatari's regime, uh, the Qatari nation building project, right? So an attempt to fashion a common citizenry out of the tribes that inhabit the territory. And so Qatar is re relatively homogeneous, but it includes Arab tribes as well as uh, uh, other ethnic groups, uh, which would have traditionally uh, been uh, taken into account in this uh, wafa, uh, kafa, uh, uh, which are now um, overlooked, right? Um, okay, this, the second, so this is the law. The second field that I want to, uh, of state intervention into family issues, uh, construes the family as an object of scientific expertise. Uh, and, and there's two kinds of expertise that I have in mind here. One is kind of more social scientific expertise, and the second one is a med medical expertise. So social scientific expertise, I mean, I could have also brought, say, the National Development Strategy, uh, which is uh, very much a pu public policy document that is very, very much invested in this family cohesion uh, agenda, but I want to I want to present to you some briefly the ways in which the Ministry of Development, Planning, and Statistics, which kind of has been created recently, regrouping the Qatar Statistics uh, Authority and other bodies, uh, seeks to track uh, marriage and divorce uh, patterns, right? And and so they provide. Um, I think very good examples of the ways in which statistics are not simply representations of the world, but also uh, tools of political intervention. Um, um, and you can see how the, the the reports through the presentation of the results about marriage and divorce, through the ways in which it selects variables for analysis, uh, what it identifies as problems, uh, is it bridges the gap between the empirical knowledge that it, statistics are supposed to provide and the normative understanding of, of what family life should be like. Um, and so one example that I highlight here is the, the ways in which consanguineous marriage has come to be represented as a problem uh, 
in, in recent reports, right? So um, not so long ago in 2010, the, 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 the ministry or the st statisticians were, uh, were careful to point out that consanguineous marriages also fulfilled part of the family cohesion agenda because they were much more stable than other forms of marriage, right? They're much, more, they're much less likely to end in divorce. Uh, more recently, in, in the reports, uh, the Ministry of Development, Planning, and Statistics has kind of stigmatized consanguineous marriages um, the, um, and, and minimized the, the, the stability or overlooked the stability uh, of these kind of marriages. Okay, so um, um, there. I mean, this is one of the ways in which a kind of scientific expertise is being invoked in, in shape and shapes family uh, life. The other one has to do with uh, medical expertise. So, so I, I, consanguineous marriages is okay. Consanguineous marriages is also a, go, a, a good a good example um, because um, senior practitioners within within Hamad Corporation and within the ministry have a very negative view. Of, uh, uh, of consanguineous marriages. They point out how uh, in places like Qatar, uh, uh, there's a significant increase in the prevalence of common diseases. Um, and, uh, and they also are ready to deploy a religious argumentation that construes Islam uh, in terms of broad principles. And so even though it's the Ministry of Public Health and not the Ministry of Al-Qaf, um, uh, they try to suggest that uh, Islam actually supports prim uh, premarital medical tests um, on, on the basis of uh, just precautionary grounds. Um, okay, so my, my third my, 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 my third field um, uh, of state intervention is construes the family as an object of religious discourse, uh, and it's primarily located within the, within the Ministry of Al-Qaf. So I think family has featured quite prominently in the ministry's attempts to become, to remain relevant in a context of rapid social change. So what you have here is like an example of a Friday sermon by Sheikh Abdullah bin Muhammad al Nyama at the National Mosque where he very clearly highlights how suspending family relations prevents the acceptance of righteous deeds. Uh, and that close family relations are among the greatest reasons for increasing baraka. Um, uh, I study the family as an object of religious discourse primarily through um, uh, the fatwas that are produced within Islam Web. Islam Web is, is attached to the ministry. Uh, it contains actually one of the world's largest online fatwa banks, and it's also Qatar's only authorized fatwa body. And here what you see is that uh, although the muftis have adopted the language of family cohesion, they understand family cohesion and its requirements in a very different way from the other state agencies. So they actually, they, they are almost indifferent to state laws uh, in many ways. Um, uh, they, uh, but um, they, they do more than simply reproduce a kind of Wahhabi or humbly Wahhabi understanding of family life. They also include a number of, uh, I think, modern assumptions about family life that uh, you can uh, you can have a look at. Um, now, there are two factors that I want to just briefly uh, discuss before I I, I, I conclude. Uh, these are factors that touch upon scientific issues. Um, and so you can see here, uh, uh, this is about uh, um, whether uh, 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 position on consanguineous marriage, right? Whether uh, what is the what is the position that the, uh, they suggest? The, the question itself is interesting because it uh, it is by it, it is it is a question that comes from someone who really thinks consanguineous marriages should be forbidden, um, uh, and who is. Um, uh, upset that religious scholars have not been more proactive in their uh, condemnation of these kind of marriages, given the number of genetic diseases that follow from it. Um, this is probably too small for you to look at, so let me just uh, summarize the way, they, the way they respond to them. So they invoke a number of scriptural, theological, and scientific arguments. Um, to, to say that actually this is a kind of marriage that is permitted. It is not discouraged or recommended, it's simply permitted. Um, and so they engage scientific evidence and they quote from scientific journals to say that actually the difference in 
genetic def defects is only very slightly higher in the case of consanguineous marriages than in the case of non-consanguineous unions. And, and then they point out some of the advantages of this kind of marriages. So it allows the family to reproduce its unique positive genetic features, such as intelligence, force, and beauty. Um, the second question uh, has to do with these premarital tests that the, now, the, the law now requires. Um, the question, again, is interesting because it comes from someone who thinks that these medical tests are a burden and create hassle, especially for women that have to undergo through them. So the petitioner asks whether the whether we can fake these certificates since um, uh, from an Islamic point of view they might not be required. And so in their answer, the muftis highlight that there are two opinions on this issue, whether the state can force premarital tests or not. Uh, for them, um, obligation can only apply in very specific cases, right? Uh, and so uh, these exceptional circumstances uh, uh, involve a particular illness becoming very widespread in a given region or in a group of people, and it requires evidences that indicate high probability of contracting the disease. And, and they do not really object to people faking medical certificates because uh, as, lo as long as the other party is involved. Um, and so, um, what I think is interesting about these fatwas, about uh, some of these bioethical issues, is that uh, they're not particularly original, right? They're very much shaped by these broader debates in the Arab world, and they draw on the proceedings of international fiqh councils. Um, but what they display is a very instrumental approach to modern science, right? Here, uh, in, in the ways they use modern science sometimes to back up their claims, you see how science does not really place, does not seem to place new epistemological demands upon the muftis, but rather is a resource that they use selectively and strategically to achieve certain goals and pre prevent designated harms. Okay, so very briefly, one minute for my conclusion. So um, what, what do I get out of this? So I try to suggest that um, in Qatar and elsewhere, perhaps in the Gulf, the family is now very much a normative category, a unity of analysis, and a legitimate object of regulatory discourse, right? That debates about marriage and divorce are also contestations over the appropriate normative framework for understanding family life. Uh, and the state deploys legal, scientific, and moral discourses, right? And while these discourses belong to particular institutional locations, state bodies, uh, they nevertheless constantly overlap in rather unexpected ways. Uh, now, Qataris seem to, by and large, accept and sometimes even advocate the role of the state in the regulation of family life, but they nevertheless seem to have maintained a critical distance towards state laws and regulations. So we know from some of these studies that cross-national marriages are rising, as well as consanguineous marriages, and celibacy remains unabated. So citizens can fake medical reports, sidestep the marriage commission that ratifies cross-national marriages, travel abroad, etc. Um, so moving forward, I think few Future research might explore more systematically how Qataris develop familial strategies in order to navigate the ambiguities of state discourse and the contradictions of modern life in the Gulf. So thank you very much. And